good morning. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Will you stand as we worship the Lord? Open up the, the heavens, Lord. We want to see your glory and we want to see your power.
trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' before his throne really speaks to me today. Hope it does to you as well. Praise God for this day. Amen. Take time to greet those around you.
feel it takes three of us to go through the announcements this morning, so buckle up, okay? First one is, inside your bulletin, you have this little You Can Make a Difference insert. We've been talking about this for three or four months, weeks now, pardon me, about ways that we can support our Compassionate Ministries Outreach Touch. So, there's a little thing. I purposely did not want to name. We don't need to know who signs what. But what I would like today, and maybe when the offering's coming in just a moment, if you know what you'd like to do, you can just say, with God's help, I will pledge X amount weekly or monthly or a one-time gift or any other way that you want to do it. And we want to see how close we get to $30,000 pledged for you can make a difference to support these ministries that are listed on this card. Okay, so we'll take these pledge cards today and uh, we'll have them available in the lobby for future weeks. Okay, Wendy? If you have been here at least nine months, you know that occasionally we have men's choir sing a special in the morning service. And rehearsals for that start tonight. We are singing on July 8th a patriotic song. And please don't tell me, guys, hey, I don't really sing. Well, if you like to sing, then you need to be here. So 5.15, I'll see you tonight in the teen room. Thanks. All right, and then we'll go ahead and have our ushers come forward as we prepare for offering. I um, want to remind you, your last opportunity to vote, if you have not yet voted in our annual elections, is right after this service. If you wait till after the second service, you'll be out of luck. They'll be closed down already. So make sure you go vote if you have not right after service. Um, this last week, we had our VBS, and it was fantastic. Um, I heard we have 101 kids who came and participated. And uh, we also had 85 adults who came, or teens, who came and helped to corral and direct and organize and everything with those kids. And so it was a fantastic time. Great. I want to say thank you to everyone who participated to help that happen. Um, and part of, well, go ahead. Part of VBS was them raising an offering. And uh, the kids usually compete against each other. I think it was boys against girls. And the money that they raised for that is going to help go for our teen mission trip, which they leave this coming week. Um, and they're going to help to pay for a playground, I think it was, down in Oklahoma City on their mission trip. Um, so we want to remind you to be sure to pray this week as the teens prepare to leave. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the kids are going to be going on their mission trip. And uh, we also have first and second graders going to camp this week. So be sure and include all those things in your prayers this week. So let's pray and receive our offering. Lord, it's such a privilege to be here. And now we just thank you now for the opportunity to come and to participate in spreading your kingdom and in being able to give back to you some of what you've given us stewardship over. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the verses that the kids memorized as they came through the station of Bible memory was Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And yes, that was only one day. That was Monday. <laughs> they got a lot of scripture in them. beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win his erring child he reconciled Time 
bounty won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me It's a pretty amazing song. The love of God that reaches out to us. I'm going to have you stand with me this morning. We're going to have a time of prayer in our service. We've invited our students who are going on mission trips, children and teens, to come to the altar. If they would, we'd like to bless them this day. The rest of us, if you'd like to come, support the teens or come and lay your own burdens down, we invite you to come to this altar this morning. We received information this weekend, a young man by the name of Ben Strauss. Uh, they, the Strauss family used to come here. They recently have been going to the Gardner Church. Well, Ben had a sudden something happen to him this weekend, and he passed. He was a young man, early 20s. And so I'd like for us to remember Arlene and her family today. If any would like to just come and represent the Strauss family, we invite you to come and kneel with us. Pastor JT, would you lead us this morning in our prayer time? Lord, we come before you today. And uh, Lord, we just want to recognize who you are, God, and how holy you are, Lord. And how you chose to come and you chose to seek us out. And Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to do that, that we might be given the opportunity to come back into relationship with you, Lord. And it's because of that example you set, Lord, that we have our altars full this morning of children and teenagers who are preparing to go and to make an effort to seek those who are outside the 99 as they go in these next couple weeks and take the opportunity to serve others in your name Lord and go to be a help in building your kingdom somewhere away from home we ask that you would bless their efforts Lord bless their work multiply their work far more than they would normally be able to accomplish. We ask, Lord, that you would bless them through this experience, that they would gain new insights about you, that they would gain new perspective on the world and new understanding of who it is that they're reaching out to, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would build their faith and draw them closer to you through this time of service. And Lord, we want to lift up Arlene and her family now. Um, it's quite a shock for her to lose Ben, and she's had a, a rough six months in other ways. And so we want to specifically lift her up right now. We ask that you bring her comfort, bring her encouragement, and bring her closer to you, Lord. Just help her to feel your arms wrapped around her and holding her up and carrying her through this. And Lord, I want to lift up the uh, good news that we've had on many friends for successful surgeries and everything throughout our congregation. Um, as I read through the prayer list in the bulletin, I saw recovering from surgery multiple times and good news for cancer tests. And God, we just praise you and thank you for your hand at work in the midst of medical issues. We ask that you would be with those who continue to struggle, that you would comfort them and bring them healing, Lord. And God, we ask that you would touch each of us and help us to go out and to follow your example also and try to be spiritual healers for this world. 
Give us a good week, Lord. Give everyone a great week preparing to leave town for mission trips. And encourage us and teach us. In your name we pray. Amen. These students represent two different trips. Uh, our teens are heading off to Oklahoma City. I think there's like 45 people going to Oklahoma City, something like that. And they take off this weekend. And then our, is it fourth, fifth, and sixth graders? Or fifth and sixth graders are heading to Nebraska. Is that correct? Nebraska to do their first mission trip. And we're very excited about that as well. Today, I would like to conclude um, what I started last week. It's a different message altogether, but it, it kind of focuses a little bit on the idea of what God has in mind for us as we devote ourselves to several things that are listed and mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. This will be the only time we divert away from Psalms or Proverbs this summer. Uh, until we get toward the end of the summer. But today, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And the message today is entitled, The Pillars. I love the cover of the bulletin. Thank you, Sabrina, or whoever put that together. It's beautiful. Uh, those pillars are so strong and so supportive. And we're able to bear the weight of much uh, much above them. And when you think about bearing weight, you think about foundational truth uh, that the Word of God mentions in Acts chapter 2 as the new church emerges. The pillars, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves, this is the believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those being saved. So the dynamic here is that on the, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches this message and the Holy Spirit anoints the Word of God and impacts the hearts of people. They were cut to the heart and they didn't know what to do, so they asked the disciples, the apostles, what can we do about the fact that we crucified Jesus? What can we do with what you told us? And Peter said, repent and be saved. And that day, on the day of Pentecost, Thousands of people became believers in Jesus Christ. This is the church that is expanding that we just read about. Every day, Jesus is bringing more people into the family of God. And the interesting thing here is, it's because of the devotion of the people to some very foundational truths. Four pillars, I like to think of them as. The first is the apostles' teaching, the, the biblical study of God. How do we go beyond our Sunday school classes to enhance our biblical foundation? Well, I would suggest, just a suggestion, you can do with it what you'd like, but I suggest that you might read the Bible on your own. That you might be amazed at what you might learn as you read the Word of God. And I would also suggest you not start in Genesis and just work your way through the end because you'll die probably somewhere in Leviticus. It's good stuff, but it's not the easiest to read initially as you are just beginning an appetite foundationally to study the Word of God. So I would encourage you to not allow the church to be your only Bible. Not the worship service, not your Sunday school class. Just don't, just don't neglect the idea of studying the Word of God on your own. 
I would also say that one of the things that we have tried to do here at Westside is that we've we've created a targeted study approach. What does the Bible say about things like family relationships or or marriages or ethics or 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 possibly finances or human sexuality or all the different topics that we could pick out? The church has decided that we really need to address these things and speak about them and and so we've created a targeted sense of, of an approach of discipling by the Word of God and becoming strong. We talk about accountability groups in our church. And uh, that, that is so exciting to some people and so uh, anxious-laden to some people. The idea that I would become transparent and authentic between a group of three or four people over time um, that kind of that isn't something that a lot of people look at as a, as a significant strength and yet I would say to you that there's nothing quite like having a group of people that you can be completely open and honest and transparent with and know that what happens in Vegas doesn't leave Vegas you understand that colloquialism don't you that what happens in that accountability group is something that is not going to be transpiring its way throughout the corridors of the church, but that it's somewhere where you can be open and un I would even say unthought through sometimes. To be trying new things and new understandings and building upon the foundation, it's good to have three or four people that you meet with on a regular basis where you can just say, what do you think about this? Or they might look at you and say, Hey, are you okay? Is there something we can talk about? You know, I know that we don't always think of this as being the truth, but the, but the reality is many times the way that we appear, our affect kind of sometimes gives us away a little bit <laughs> as to what might be going on in our lives when we see a heaviness on someone's face um, and then we ask the old patented question how's it going <laughs> and the, the answer many times when we don't want to share is oh it's going great but to know that I have some people in my life that foundationally believe like I believe in the Word of God and the stability of the Word of God and what it might offer to us to have that ability to talk on a regular basis. Uh, that's kind of one of the ways that we could develop in the Word of God, for sure. I like the idea of the cross-generational approach. Um, my question is, do you think it's possible for us sometime in the near future, who knows what near future means, but sometime in the near future, to coordinate our preaching and our teaching to all the generations at the same time? You think that's possible? Do you think that the student pastors and me could get together and we could figure out how in the world to create and produce a timed curriculum that would have us all studying the same thing at the same time? Would that not be a hoot? Would there not be strength in that? So that when you come home and share your life with the different ages of people in your family, we've all just gone through the same kind of experience in the Word of God. Instead of having to decide, well, I wonder why it is we talked about this and, and our children talked about this. And I think there's, there's some strength there that possibly we could establish a stronger foundation with. I, I know that it would take some coordination. <laughs> I get that. And Isaac and Tom and JT and I, we'd have to figure out if we like each other well enough to do that. You guys, that's when you can smile because there wasn't nothing serious about that. Okay? All right? Let your affect go. It's all right. This idea that we might be able to have a cross-generational approach in the way that we build into the lives of our, all the ages of our family. How about multiple reinforcement? 
as a way of developing biblical foundation. And what I mean by that, let me give you an example. Pastor Isaac is providing a great example of this by changing two things on Sunday morning. He and his workers are all, are all writing their own curriculum, like I was just talking about. And secondly, they are changing the order of the day on Sunday morning for our children. Uh, they are worshiping first with a message that paves the way for the applied Sunday school development, the lesson, to build upon. Uh, what an idea that our pastor to children has the opportunity to be the first voice of the lesson that's going to be taught in the second service where it is practically applied. I also know that there are some adult Sunday school classes in our church that take the message that is preached on Sunday morning and they go to their own classes and they apply it. What did it say to you? How does it develop your life? And it gives the opportunity for a dialogue to occur after a monologue paradigm. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. And I'm excited about how it will develop the life of the biblical foundation and the Word of God. These kinds of reinforcements enhance the place of biblical teaching within us. So we are devoted as was the first church to the apostles' teaching. We are also devoted to fellowship. Fellowship. I have a question. How much like the Acts chapter 2 community do we want to be like? Fair question. As you read the scripture, you see the way that they live their lives together. We, we notice that they uh, had all things in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They met every day together in the temple courts. They broke bread in each other's homes. Da 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 da. The, this example of Acts chapter 2 church, my question is here in our Western culture, how much of that do we want to be like? Let me throw a few things out. We're probably not going to be, every, be together every day in each other's homes. We're probably not going to combine our assets into one pool. However, if we want to do that, I'd be more than glad to oversee it. <laughs> We're probably not going to get, to get together every day in church. And we're probably not going to all share the same common interests. I would say foundationally we will share an interest in the development of Christ within us, but we're probably going to have some varied interests, I think, unless you all want to come over and become avid baseball fans. I can walk with you on that journey. Some of you don't even like baseball, and I, I'm so sad I pray for you daily. As I think about our Western culture, to try and impose that kind of thing upon our 21st century Western society as the way we are to live is missing the point of the dynamic of fellowship. The principle of fellowship cannot be underscored enough to the life-giving success of the body of Christ. We could, for sure, share more life together than we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that doesn't necessarily mean more sanctioned church events. Families can get together. You can hang out. And families who, uh, who, who are spiritually like-minded can get together and you don't have to worry about some of the stuff that might occur in the setting if we were with people who are pre-converted. You notice I use the word pre-converted, not pagan heathenistic people. Just people that haven't given their lives yet to Christ. Pre-converted. You're going to probably run into some tensions with those folks. Uh, my softball love is a wonderful example of that. Not the church team. <laughs> but the guys I play with in the 55 and over league, they are not all that established in Christ. In fact, there are interesting things that happen on that night of softball that they have learned to recognize that, uh, oh my, 
what did I just say? And some of them don't have the, know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. And some of them say things like this, oh, I'm so sorry, Father. <laughs> and so I play with them a little bit. It's okay, my son. <laughs> I filter well. <laughs> and you have to filter well when you're in the culture. Because the last thing you want is to try to make some sort of impact in the life of somebody by shunning them by the way they behave. Just let it roll off, folks. And then be sure you live well in front of them. And you'd be surprised at the number of times that it shifts to a good place of conversation, a good place of sharing with them. But I can tell you right up front, in these secular encounters that we have in the world, they're not going to be as like-minded as they could be if we spent more time in the body. You're going to hang out somewhere. Why not with the body? So this idea that Fellowship is significant as we share more life together is very apropos. Some of the ways that I know that we're experts at sharing life and staying connected is through messages on Facebook or tweeting one another or, you know, ways that weren't available many years ago. And, and if you have the latest technological stuff, by the way, I just want... All the teens that confiscated my flip phone and changed the cover on, or the face, the background of my phone. I, for, for a month and a half, I had Hunter Bogart <laughs> as my background on my phone. <laughs> they confiscated it at, at uh, uh, Nathan's, Nathan Dutton's graduation party and they were having so much fun at my expense. I finally found some loving person that would change you off of my background and I now again have my lovely little chummy my little chihuahua who loves me unconditionally wiggles from head to toe nobody loves you like a dog folks I'm just telling you this idea that we have constant access to one another is another way that we can stay involved. It's different than how it was in the first century when they physically had to be somewhere. Now we can be with somebody just at the spur of the moment. And I know that builds into the lives of our family, of our church family. We can help meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in a tangible way. We can make a meal for somebody that's recovering from some long-term therapy or has gone through a difficulty. We can pay a bill if the Lord tugs on your heart and says, I want you to do this for so-and-so. Don't fight with God. Just do what God asks you to do. I have it. My suspicion is most of us in this room at one time or another have been the recipient of the Lord tugging on the heart of somebody to do something. We can provide a place to stay for them if something happens, if, a, if a air conditioning or electricity goes out or there's just a, a, a transition in their life, we can provide a place for someone to stay with. I remember when the Hurricane Charlie went through Florida, only been there a couple years, didn't really know much about hurricanes, but I remember thinking, this, I, somebody better help me. Because I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. And as Charlie pretty much stayed south of us a little bit, did serious devastation in Port Charlotte and Punta Gorda and, and even as close to us as Northport, which is about 15 miles away, uh, the winds blew and tore down, and don't feel sad for me, but tore down my screened lanai, which was over my in-ground pool. Don't hate me. In Florida, that seems to be a thing. And, and so my screens came down some of them and electricity went off for two hours and I mean for two days and it, it was rather hot in Florida in first of August and not only was it hot it was humid and I think 
I probably would have been a great uh, weight loss program had I stayed there. But it was unbearable, and family in our church called us up and said, How you doing? They lived about three minutes from us. They lived right on the Gulf of Mexico. Somehow we lost everything. They lost nothing. They said, How are you doing? We said, Well, there's, here's what's going on, and we're not sure how long we're going to be without power. And they said, Well, you're going to come stay with us. And so my wife and I and my two sons, we went over and we stayed with the Barbie family for about two days as it took time for the the power to come back on in our in our little neighborhood those are the kinds of things that build into the fellowship the shared life of a church that quite frankly we are a blessed people to have that with one another don't you think to have that kind of reach out and impact in the lives of our family These are the things that reflect a church's devotion to fellowship. Thirdly, we are devoted to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. When I think about the breaking of bread, I really think about worship and the sacramental elements of worship. I I view it differently than sharing in one another's homes a fellowship meal or time together. I look at this as the way that we worship and the sacraments that have been developed by Uh, by Christ to help us worship him whether it be baptism which was a significant part of the commission of Christ to the disciples go into all the nations and make disciples baptizing them sacramentally bringing them to a place where they realized they were dead in their sins but now because of Christ they are alive they are resurrected from the, the, the sting of death from the control of death as they rise up out of the waters the sacrament of baptism should be a a central part of the west side church experience and i would go so far as to say that we now have the capability with a, a baptismal that is in our service all the time a portable baptismal we can have baptismal services now any time at any moment when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ and they want to identify with the resurrected life of the giving power of God we should have baptism way more often as a sign of the working and the power of the Spirit of God in our church in the sacramental blessing of the worship of coming to life through Jesus Christ and what he has offered but we also think of the breaking of bread the significance of the Eucharist the sharing of the Lord's Supper together when we think about Jesus Christ's passion the the very fact that it was God's will that we remember that his son was sent that we might be saved from our sins through the cross that led to the blood of the redemption the blood of a lamb Jesus Christ brings us to a place where we remember we remember all that Christ has done it's not that Christ dies every time that we have communion Every time we share in the sacrament, it's not that Christ is doing it all over again. It's the very fact that Christ once did that, that we might be saved. And we remember what it is like when Jesus forgave us of our sins and cleansed us from our past. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed. And some people ask me, why don't we have the Eucharist more often? Why is it we have it at just such a time? I have been in churches that have done it far less frequently. And I know that there are churches of the Nazarene who do a Eucharist every Sunday. We have the celebration of the Lord's Communion every month on the last Sunday of the month. We've contemplated with other opportunities 
to make the sharing of the breaking of bread something possible on a more regular basis. I don't know how it's going to come down, but I know that every time that we do this, breaking of the bread, the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, we can do so in an anticipation that we are at the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are celebrating what He has done in our lives, and He has settled in among us and reminded us of the passion that He has brought to our lives. And as we break the bread and we drink the juice we do so in remembrance that he he is here he he did this for us but he is here presently with us at the table and it reminds us that there's coming a day when we will be at the Lord's table in heaven there's coming a day when Jesus Christ will come again it reminds us of the redemption that is yet to come not for the forgiveness of sins but for the recreation of a world a universe gone bad that one day one day Jesus is going to again make it all as it was intended to be the Bible says that. We're devoted to it, remember? <laughs> devoted to the foundation that as we worship Jesus Christ in spirit and truth in this body of believers, we can do so with a completion of what Jesus Christ has already done in us and yet at the same time realize that there's more yet to come. I like that. I am fully done right now. The best that Christ has done in me, fully now, and yet I am not done at all. I like that. I think that does no violence whatsoever to the idea of sanctification. <laughs> I am sanctified, fully set apart for Jesus Christ right now, this very moment. And yet, Jesus is still directing my life and changing I am sanctified and I am being sanctified set apart for the kingdom of God there you go devoted to the breaking of bread finally this church was devoted to prayer prayer I'd like to take the remainder of our time this morning to talk about prayer one of my questions is, what hinders our prayer life? When I think about things that hinder me talking to God, and all of us talking to God, I think of things like time constraints as a hindrance. I think of things like people's statements to me like, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray like you pray. I, I, don't, I hear people pray and I just don't know how to do it. I, I believe that one of the hindrances to prayer life is a spiritual dryness. It's disconnect from an intimate relationship with Christ. And I think what happens is that we we get a little dry and a little disconnected from Christ and before you know it it's been a long time since we talked to him I think one of the hindrances are a lot of people in the world today have a vague belief in prayers effectiveness oh you really think that stuff works <laughs> aren't you just talking yourself into something I hear people say the reasons are many but they are nothing more than excuses for a less than desired prayer life so I thought how how are some ways that we could pray why well, I, I would encourage you to pray the scriptures that there is great power praying the Word of God to God why is that why do you think possibly there might be great sense of power in praying the Word of God to God. Well, I don't know what you think about this, but 
every now and then somebody will quote something I say, and I go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty good stuff. Well, who said it? Well, I did. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, please, every analogy breaks down somewhere. Don't take that into the ego, maniacal kind of wacko man up there preaching to you right now. I'm just trying to give you an example of how sometimes when we say something, it's good to know that people are listening and, and actually applying it a little bit. Do you think maybe God is just a little bit excited by the idea that we might be studying His Word enough to where we pray back to Him? God, you said, da 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 da. So praying the scriptures is something I would encourage you to think about. The scriptures that pop up to your mind in the middle of your prayer and thought life, just pray it out to God. Oh, God, you said. I mean, we talk about the promises all the time of God. I think it's okay. You can pray the promises to God. And just let him open up to the idea that this is what he has said he will do. and You have confidence in that. I think maybe we should pray prayers of praise. I just jotted down a couple since I wasn't preaching on Psalms today. Uh, I just jotted down a, a few Psalms like Psalm 50, 55, uh, pardon me, 95, 1 and 2. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. Oh, Father, let me sing to you this morning. And we must think that that's important because every Sunday we worship in song, do we not? Singing praise to the Lord. Psalm 36, 5, and 5 through 7 says, and I love this. This is a song, I think Third Day does a song from this particular psalm. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the great deep. Oh, Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Straight out of the book of Psalms, a psalm of praise, a prayer of praise to the Father, identifying what you believe in Him and the ability He has. Or Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2, I mean, verse 47, Psalm 47, 1 and 2 says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. Clap your hands, oh you people. We must not have ever read that before here. Because <laughs> clapping of the hands just doesn't happen much here. Sing for joy. Oh, that our faces and our bodies would begin to identify the expression of thanksgiving to the Lord as we sing. And I suspect that some of us are a little less inhibited when we're all by ourselves than we are when we're in a group. I say knock yourself out when you're singing in your car or in your shower or wherever you sing. Sing praise to the king. Let him, let him know how deeply you praise him. I think we should pray for petitions Another psalm says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. To just lay ourselves open before God and say, This is the problem. As if I'm telling you, God, anything you don't already know. This is the problem. And of course, the mercy of God is an amazing thing. One of the things that I think about with prayer that would help us unlock the hindrances that keep us away from the intimate kind of relationship with God we could have is to pray without ceasing. Which basically means anywhere, anytime, anything you can pray to God about. 
It doesn't mean that you're all day long, 24-7, praying, but it means that at any moment you can pray. One of the things that Wendy does is when we pass an accident, she prays for the people in the accident. Don't know them. Hope that nothing is severe. But those are the kinds of things that model to your children how significant and how important it is that you pray in a heartbeat, in a moment, about things you know about and things that you don't know about. That makes God so big in the eyes of your children, your grandchildren, to just pray for someone in, in an accident, maybe. Or another thing that we've done in our lives is when we get a, uh, one of the Christmas cards or Christmas newsletter, we kind of combine them in a pile on the table and, and then we'll sometimes, we haven't done this for a while, but we'll pull one out and we'll read the card for somebody and it's from Mr. and Mrs. Dododo. <laughs> Have you ever met the Dododos? They are lovely people. And we just, we just take time to pray for their family. As they have been a blessing to us, now, Lord Jesus, may we take a moment and just make a petition for them. There is prayer power. Intercession. Where two or three gather together and agree in request, we can ask and it will be cared for by God. It's not always as we think it ought to be done, I recognize. And it sometimes has, it has a need for us to just accept that the Lord's will is different than what our will would be about something. But the fact of the matter is there is power in intercession that I can't explain. I'm thankful I can pray individually, anytime, anywhere. But when we agree together about something, and that's why we have pastoral open altar prayer time, is it gives us an opportunity to join together in prayer about something. Devotion to prayer is a pillar. Just as fellowship, just as breaking of bread, just as the devotion to the apostles' teaching. The result was, as I look at that passage of Scripture, the result was there was a whole lot of praising God going on. There was an abundance of good favor experienced among the people. There was an evangelistic impact galore in the community as the Lord added to their number daily those being saved. If making Christ-like disciples is our stated objective, where will we pour our energy and resources? I vote on this last day of the annual election. I vote in the pillars. That's where we should pour ourselves. Into the pillars so that Christ can build the house the way he wants. That is my thought for the day. I'll have another one next week. Hope you'll come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for the goodness of God. We thank you for how this example of what happened in Acts chapter 2, the devotion of your people to some very foundational truth made a difference in the establishment of the church in Jerusalem throughout the world and for 2,000 years now, Lord, it has continued to make an impact in the lives of people. We are surrounded, Lord Jesus, by people who do not know you. Our desire, Father, is that as we devote ourselves to become closer to you and to allow you to develop us, that we can fulfill, Lord Jesus, your commission to reach neighbors and family and friends and 
people all around the world. We want to be a part of kingdom business. So, King of Kings, please come and develop our hearts as we devote ourselves over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as Pastor JT brings a benediction? May we, as the body of Christ, be devoted to the practices of fellowship, compassion, worship, discipleship, and prayer. As an example, that draws those of the world to come join the fellowship of believers. Go in unity.